Well, I think this is a, a good time to look at this next parable uh, that we're going to look at today, the, the, the wheat and the weeds, or the, the wheat and the tares it's sometimes referred to. But the question I want to bring to you first before we get into the parable is, is God really in control? Is God really in control? Could it be that Jesus was right? That God's kingdom is breaking into the world in him and is now, even at this time, present. Are Christians right to believe that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection signaled that something new had broken in and was not going to disappear until it came in its fullness? Is the kingdom of God present here in this broken world? Isn't the kingdom a place where the will of the king is done? If so, why so much pain? Why so much evil? What does it mean for the kingdom of God? Well, if you can imagine with me that you are a first century Jew, you are living in the promised land, perhaps. But even though you're in the promised land, you have been for generations underneath the control of other empires. And even now, the Roman Empire is in control. <clears throat> Ultimately can limit what you do. And in the midst of all that, you are hoping, hoping and praying that the Messiah would come to bring back the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Israel, all enmeshed into one. So imagine with me that you are that person, you are that first century Jew, and then you bump into this man, a carpenter turned rabbi from a podunk little town, Nazareth who proclaims to you that the kingdom of God is near. I don't know about you, but I'd look around and say, what? Romans are still in charge. The nations are not recognizing us and our God. Justice is not being done. People expect that the Messiah to do certain things in those days, to kick out the Romans, to create a pure community, to judge the world. In fact, John the Baptist expected the Messiah to bring judgment, so much so that when it wasn't happening right away, he sent messengers after the fact to Jesus to say, are you really the one we've been waiting for? Are you the coming one, he asked. The truth is, is that the expectations at the time of Jesus' arrival were different than what arrived with Jesus. Expectations are powerful things. So powerful that if we're not careful, we'll miss the real thing when it actually arrives. Has anybody here ever watched The Voice? Okay, if you, if I see some hands, some reluctant hands. Okay, yes, yes. My wife and I, we like to watch The Voice sometimes when we have an opportunity. If you've never watched it, it's a singing competition, competition show. And the catch with it is that the singers come out and the judges cannot see them. That's why they call it the voice. It's supposed to just be about the voice. So as you can imagine, sometimes these people come out and they sing, and when the judges turn around and they let the, the at-home audience see who's actually up there singing, your jaw hits the floor. And Lauren and I were watching the first episode of this new season, and there was a moment like that. You're sitting there, and you're listening, and you're hearing this beautiful voice. It sounds like a beautiful woman, woman's voice, just pristine. And then all of a sudden, the judges turn around, and the lights come up, and it is not a woman at all. It is a bearded man. <laughs> and everyone was stunned. The judges were stunned. Lauren and I were stunned because if you would have heard that voice recorded, and then this person walked in and said, yeah, that's me, you would have said, no way. That's not your voice. 
expectations are hugely, hugely powerful. And Jesus knew that people's expectations about what it would look like for the kingdom to draw near. Jesus knew there was going to be mismatched expectations. And so he gives them a parable, as he often does. So I'm going to read this parable for you. It's brief. Jesus told them another parable. This is in chapter 13 of Matthew, starting in verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The other servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At time, that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. So we get this parable, another agricultural one, right? Um, similar to what we talked about last week with the sower, except this time, instead of the seed being the word of God, the seed is people. The seed is people. So we have this farmer who carefully, carefully planted his field. Furrows were straight. The, the highest quality seed was placed. And he goes to bed. And while he's sleeping, an act of agricultural terrorism. Weeds are planted. Now, we miss this in our English tr translation, but this weed that's planted is called darna. And we don't have a whole lot of problem with this anymore, as I understand it, but it was a major weed problem with wheat crops in the past because this darna looks exactly like wheat until it grows up to the point where it has the heads with the grains, and the darna heads of grain are black. <coughs> But for my gardeners, and the parable mentions this as well, you know by the time the wheat is that tall, what are the, what are the root systems doing in these plants? It would be impossible to rip out those weeds without destroying the wheat with it. So, even still, with that problem at hand, this was going to be no picnic for a farmer if they had that much darnel growing in their fields. Because presumably, if you wait till the harvest, you're going to drop more seeds, and what's going to happen next year? You're going to have more of this false wheat, as they call it in some areas, popping up. <clears throat> so I think the first listeners would have heard this, and they would have recognized that this farmer was having uh, was in a great um, tough place. But I, I do think that they would have been surprised. I think most in that day probably would have somehow wanted to go in there and deal with the weeds before harvest. Because the deal with it after harvest would have been a real bear. So let's take a look at Jesus' explanation that he gives. This is, again, one of, I think, three parables that Jesus gives that he actually explains. That starts in verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where they will be weeping and gnashing their teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. All right. So as I've been teaching, we need to be what with parables? We need to be careful with what questions we're asking them. And this is perhaps especially true of this parable, because throughout the centuries, people have really had a field day with this one. No pun intended. <laughs> They have taken this parable and they've wanted to answer the question, what do we do about evil? 
They wanted to answer the question, what do we do as believers, what do we as Christians do about evil? But the problem is, that's not what this parable is trying to answer. And so in their effort to use this parable to answer what to do about evil, it's resulted in zealotry. People wanting to go out there and, and, and attack the evil people. You can go back and look at the Crusades as an example of that. It's also, unfortunately, been used to say this parable is about the church. Those of us within the church, right? There's wheat and weeds within the church itself. Now, is it possible that there are true believers and false believers within the walls of the church? Absolutely. But is that the conversation that this parable is trying to answer? No. And so the problem with that was some people would say, well, we need to go and have, a, have an inquisition in the church itself, right? And then the other side, you had those that said, well, this is saying we just don't need to worry about evil in the church. And so it led to sort of a lackadaisical attitude about how people behave within the church. Now, none of that, those are, those are important questions for us to answer, right? But it's not the intent of the parable. The intent of the parable is, what do we say about the reality of the presence of the kingdom of God alongside the reality of evil? And as the parable tells us, really, the reason being for this is that God is patient. God is patient and God is gracious. And so, he is waiting for as many as possible to turn to him and be saved. And in the meantime, he allows the free will, and oftentimes evil will, of people in the world to run rampant. So if we're going to answer the question of what should we actually take away from this parable, we need to hear that main point. As Christians, we should not be surprised about the presence of evil in the world. The presence of evil in the world should not be surprising to us. It's something we should expect. That's what this parable is laying out for us. The kingdom of God, which is the antithesis of evil, is alongside the kingdom of this world, which rebels against God and delights in evil. So while we're not to be passive towards evil, we do need to recognize that this parable clears up any kind of notion we're going to have that we are going to end evil. Are you with me? This is not a call for passivity, but it's a call for us to recognize that until Christ returns, evil itself is not going to be fully dealt with. Things are going to be hard. Things are going to be messy. This world is going to be a dark place much of the time because God is delaying and deferring judgment. The kingdom is both here and not yet fully here. It seemed that when Jesus came and he proclaimed the nearness of the kingdom of God, he could say that the kingdom was here. Because the kingdom is where God's will is done. And that can be on a macro level throughout the whole world. And it can also be in the lives of God's people. So we recognize the kingdom is indeed present. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is here in the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the work of the church. But we don't get rattled. We don't question God's presence. We don't question God's goodness simply because we look around and see all the problems in the world. Now this is a tough one. This parable kind of glances by one of the hardest questions that you may ever encounter as a believer. And if you haven't had someone ask you this question, I'm sure it will happen at some point. But they will ask you the question, how can there really be a God who is good when there is so much terrible evil and death and illness in the world? Now, this parable doesn't totally solve that. That question has its own name, the question of theodicy. It doesn't totally solve that question for us, but it certainly addresses it. As Christians, we can say, yeah, we know there's a lot of bad stuff out 
God is not in favor of it. But because God has granted humanity free will and desires that they would turn to him, that very act of allowing us to have free will is also necessarily going to allow evil to work. The other uh, thing that I don't want you to miss in this parable is that we cannot ignore the theme of judgment. Now, for believers who are, I think, you know, my age and younger, judgment is probably about the least favorite topic ever. You ever try to talk about judgment with young believers? Not good. We don't like it. It makes us feel uncomfortable. In fact, a couple summers ago, I talked with a child and a friend, and they said to me, you know, I think the church is just too picky. You know, they're just too picky. They, nit, they nitpick on things. I think they should just focus on what Jesus says. You know, loving people. Now, I didn't really dig into it there. I didn't pull out this parable or anything like that, but the truth is, Jesus was very comfortable talking about judgment. With Jesus, it was always in one hand this unlimited grace, and in the other, the call to repentance and the reality of coming judgment. Open up your New Testaments and look, this is what Jesus taught. So while it makes us uncomfortable, we really only want to talk about the warm, fuzzy Jesus. Jesus thought this was important. And if you ask me, as hard and uncomfortable as it is to talk about judgment, it does underscore how seriously God takes evil. For the same people that wonder where is God for all this evil going on, this reality of judgment reminds us that God's not ignoring it. God takes it very, very seriously, and his plan is to end all of that. So when I've spent time with people who are in really tough places, something hard has happened in their life, something really awful. And they're wondering, where is God? I think this parable does help us in that conversation a little bit. God is here. God is sovereign. And the reason he's allowing this to go on is because he cares for people so much. And let me tell you, he is with you. He, he, he is not happy about what happened to your loved one. So much so that he's going to sort it out. And one day, all tears and evil and death itself are going to be gone and swallowed up. So let them who have ears hear. Let's pray. Oh God, sometimes we struggle. struggle to see all of the awful things that take place in this world. God, when we think about how capable you are, we want you to act. Sometimes we wonder why you allow things to go on. God, remind us by the power of your spirit that it is your great love and desire for humanity that is deferring all of this. May we hope in the day, the day that's coming, when your kingdom arrives in its fullness and all of the garbage that is wrong with your creation is restored and prepared. In Jesus' name.